Um, okay, I am pleased to welcome you to the fifth Think Better talk presented by the Center for Decision Research. The purpose of this program is to explore how insights from behavioral science affect society, shape policy, impact business, and improve individual lives. This is our second event for the academic year, and we're already looking forward to seeing you at our next event uh, here at the same time, same place on April 29th, where we'll be having Alyssa Fishbane, uh, Managing Director at Ideas42, which is an organization that uses behavioral science to design scalable interventions. The Think Better series is just one of the many activities in the Center for Decision Research that we pursue in support of the behavioral sciences. In addition to our terrific faculty who are leaders in research in this area, we also run workshops and brown bag seminars, award research grants to promising young scholars to advance knowledge in the field. The CDR also runs the PIMCO Decision, Decision Research Laboratories, which allow us to conduct cutting edge behavioral science research downtown in Hyde Park on campus and at several pop-up locations throughout the city, including the Museum of Science and Industry, the Chicago Parks District, the Second City, and today here at the Gleacher Center. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my friend and colleague, Adam Alter, as a speaker for tonight's event. Adam is an associate professor of marketing at New York University's Stern School of Business. Adam is the New York Times bestselling author of not one, but two books, uh, Irresistible, recently published in March of 2017, which considers why so many people today are addicted to so many behaviors, from incessant smartphone and internet use to video game playing and online shopping, as well as Drunk Tank Pink, Drunk Tank Pink published in 2013, which investigates how hidden forces in the world around us shape our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Adam's academic research focuses on judgment and decision making and social psychology, with a particular interest in the sometimes surprising effect that subtle cues in the environment can have on human cognition and human behavior. Adam received his Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from the University of New South Wales and his Master's and PhD from Princeton University in Psychology. On a personal note, uh, Adam was one of the very first people who I met when considering a career in behavioral science. Uh, he was finishing his PhD at Princeton as I was just thinking about starting my own, uh, and he played a pivotal role in my decision to uh, start a PhD at Princeton where we would have the opportunity to overlap for a year. Um, Adam has been a mentor and a role model to me in addition to a friend. In every interaction that I've had with Adam, I believe every single one, he always uh, shares unique insights and interesting knowledge. Uh, which makes me very excited to hear what he has to say today. So without further ado, I introduce Adam Alter. Thanks, Abby. That was uh, an unusually kind introduction, so thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the CDR for having me. Thank you, Nick, for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for taking some time out of your, I'm sure, very busy nights to join me. So I'm going to talk tonight about um, the rise of, of our, you can use the word addiction, we'll use that word for now, addiction to screens and how that's shifted over time. And I want to do three things. I want to talk about the nature of the problem, try to outline it, sketch it for you, tell you why I think it's a real issue. I want to talk about some of the drivers that make it so hard for us to resist our screens. That's really the behavioral science part of the talk. And then I'll touch on some potential solutions to the problem after that if we have time. And I'm happy to take questions on that on that note as well. So I became interested in this question a number of years ago. Um, I used to watch the Apple events where Steve Jobs would describe his new products. And I found the, the Apple event for the iPad pretty interesting. It was about 90 minutes long. It was a few months before Jobs died. So he was not in great health. But up on stage, he was incredibly magnetic, as he usually was. And um, he described the iPad in glowing terms. And the media didn't take too well to the iPad in the beginning. They made fun of the name. They called it a glorified, oversized iPhone, but you couldn't make phone calls with it. So they were mostly pretty critical. But Jobs said, this is going to be Apple's biggest product in a long time. And he was right. It was tremendously successful. And among other things, he said, what this device does is extraordinary. It offers the best way to browse the web. 
way better than a laptop and a smartphone. It's an incredible experience. And in the course of describing it, he basically said, everyone should have it and their kids should have an iPad too. Fast forward about three months and a journalist at the New York Times, Nick Bilton, who covered the tech beat at the time, he had regular phone calls with Jobs after Apple released new products. And he always asked Jobs questions about how the product had been received, whether Apple was happy so far. So Bilton spoke to Jobs and asked him a whole series of questions. And then as the call was wrapping up an hour later, he threw in a softball question, the kind of friendly question you give to someone you know fairly well, you've spoken to many times. He asked Jobs, so your kids must love the iPad, remembering that Jobs had said everyone's kids should have access to iPads. There is an obvious response to this if you're in business and if you're as savvy as Jobs, which is, yes, they think it's the greatest thing ever. What Jobs said was so surprising to Bilton that it formed the basis for an article in the Times that's now been read hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times. Jobs said, they haven't used it. We limit how much technology our kids <laughs> use at home. I found that staggering. As a scientist who studies human behavior, the, this, this disjunction between what Jobs had said publicly and what he was doing privately was fascinating to me. There's this principle in business known as dog fooding. So I had a friend growing up whose dad worked for Coke, and so everything they, they had in their home was Coke. Everything was Coca-Cola. If you mentioned the P word, <laughs> it was a problem. They weren't allowed to drink Pepsi or Pepsi products in public. It was a, it was a thing. That's dog fooding. Dog fooding is the idea that you publicly use your product to demonstrate that if it's good enough for you, it must be good enough for your consumers. The extreme version of this and where the term comes from is from a, an executive of a dog food company who used to go to his investor meetings. He'd always make them lunch meetings, and he'd bring a can of the dog food, and he'd eat the dog food. Because if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for their pets. So that's where dog fooding comes from. This is a stark violation of dog fooding. Jobs saying, use my product, but also I will not have my kids go anywhere near my product. So I found this fascinating. And actually, it's not an isolated case, which is what Bilton found when he dug deeper. He looked at other tech titans. One of the most extreme examples is the Waldorf School of the Peninsula. This is one of the many Waldorf schools around the country and the world. And the Waldorf School has an interesting policy with respect to tech, which is that until kids are about 13 or 14, they are not exposed to screens. Education happens face to face, pens, pencils, often outdoors. This is supposed to be the most engaging way to educate. So this is a school where kids are kept as far away from screens as possible. In contrast to many private schools where giving them iPads and screens is an ostentatious way of demonstrating how wealthy the school is, how many means it, what, what sort of means it has. So this is a departure from that. The interesting thing about this particular Waldorf school in the Bay Area is that 75% of the students at this one are the children of Silicon Valley tech execs. So they found the one school in the Bay Area that will keep their kids away from screens for as long as possible. So again, I, you look at all these anecdotes, and they're interesting. And the question is, what was Jobs afraid of? What was it that he knew way back in 2010 that I think a lot of us are starting to recognize now? And that's what really drew me in, what made me curious about this. So <clears throat> here is some of the stuff that I think he knew that, that made him concerned. Um, the, the companies that we're talking about that have created products that we can't stop using are very skillful at creating those products in ways that make them difficult for us to resist. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things they do. Um, I'm sure you all know, or at least have heard of, if not played World of Warcraft and Fortnite, or your kids maybe, if, you're, if you have kids, have played these games. What these companies do is they have access to, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users. So what they can do without any real theory about what's going to drive these users to play the game is they can A-B test. They can manipulate small features of the game, release different versions to different users, and then see what sticks. In the gaming world, this is known as color coding. So you'll color code some of the code and say, you'll get the green version, you'll get the blue version. Let's see what happens. Who plays for longer? So let me illustrate how that works in, say, World of Warcraft. So in World of Warcraft, you are in a guild. So it's you and a kind of team of other players who have characters, avatars. You go on these missions. And people play all hours of the night. They'll play from other guild members from across the world. So what the creators of the game might do is they might say, for half of the guilds, we will create a mission where they have to find an artifact. For the other half, they're going to have to save someone. There's a character they have to rescue. And then let's see what happens. And what they might find is, People who are saving a character 
instead of just looking for an artifact, that human engagement is important and it draws them in. They spend an extra, say, 10% of time playing or an extra 20 minutes on average in each, each session. If you know that, you don't give people the missions that cause them to play less. You just privilege the one that gets them to play more. Then you build in another little tweak. So the second round of this kind of trial by combat of these different versions, you might say one version will be in country A and one version will be in country B. Country A has lots of forests. Country B has lots of oceans. Turns out people love being by the ocean. And so what you find is people who have that mission play for an extra 10% or 20 minutes longer. If you keep doing that, say, over 20 rounds, the version that arrives on your desktop has been designed not for your well-being, but it's been designed to capture as much of your time and attention as possible. So that's one of the things people are concerned about. There's a, a nice example of this from Facebook as well. And why I like this is because this was so brilliantly packaged from a marketing perspective. So in uh, 2013, um, Sorry, 2016, Facebook introduced a change to their lineup of emojis. So you, you, for years, you could like something. You could say, I like that content. We all know the, the thumbs up and how that works. And then Facebook said, you know, for years, people have been telling us they want a thumbs down. We want to show disapproval. So they said, what we're going to do is give you a whole menu of different responses. So you'll have a much finer palette of options when you want to respond to people. So they released these other emojis. This is apparently the... People don't necessarily use these, but you've got love, ha, ha, yay, wow, sad, and angry. So now you, you can respond in different ways. And people said, this is great. Facebook's listening to us. Consumers have asked, and they have responded. It took them a few years, but here we are. And so from the perspective of the, of the consumer, this is something that's, that's done in response to a request. One thing it does from Facebook's perspective, though, is it allows them to determine which kinds of emotional responses grip people. When I like something, do I spend more time on the platform? Or do I spend more time when I think it's funny or when I love it? What they discover from this is which emotion hooks people the most? Anger. Anger is the most engaging emotion. And so now we all live inside this echo chamber that privileges anger. The algorithm, since it privileges attention, makes us, by design, a little bit angrier. That's another example of how these, these tools are designed for, for, I think, negative outcomes for our well-being. So that's the sort of thing I think Jobs was concerned about. But on a, on a different scale, looking at a different metric, let's look at how the average 24-hour workday looks. So this is for adults. It looks similar for kids. There are some differences. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to fill in the average workday at three time periods, 2007, 2015, and 2017. And I'm going to fill this in with different activities that the average American spends time on. So for example, sleep. We spend on average, and it hasn't changed that much since 2007, we spend on average about seven and a half to eight hours sleeping. I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old. So someone in here is sleeping 15 hours to make up for me. But that's the average for the average adult. Working and commuting is about eight and a half or nine hours. You can already see how little of that white space is left. And then when you add in things like eating, bathing, taking care of kids, there's a little bit of that white space left. And so the question is, what do we do with this discretionary space? This is like if you had a budget, you paid for your mortgage or your rent, you paid for your food. This is what's left over at the end. This is where the magic potentially happens. And so what's going on with that magic time? I'll show you how much of it in these different time periods was spent in front of screens. So 2007 is an important year because it's the year the iPhone was introduced. That was a sea change. That brought in some really big changes. 2015. Um, it was just before I, I published the book, I was writing the final draft, and I called a guy who had created an app that was designed to track time use. And so he gave me some data from 2007, and then he said, I'm going to share with you how long the average person spends in front of different screens. And so he had some data that he shared. 2017, two years later, it's not a big gap between 15 and 17, um, but I called him up and I said, has anything changed? And he said, yes, the picture has changed. People are spending more time than before. So this is how much time was spent in 2007, this is how much in 15, and this is how much in 17. That tiny little sliver in yellow there is now where you're confining exercise, spending time in natural environments, face-to-face -face communication. This is for the average person, the average adult. And in te some teens, there is no yellow space in particular. So this is a pretty striking change across time, and it shows you why I think people like Jobs were concerned. Because even if you don't understand what it is that's driving this kind of engagement, you can see the consequences of it in how we've shifted in how we spend our time. 
I just want to give you a couple more illustrations that I find really quite interesting. This is an experiment that I've been running with thousands of people. It's not really an experiment. It's a simple question. People who are everything from uh, the age of 13 up. So the age range, I think we have people in their 90s who've answered this question. So everything between 13 and 90s. So the question is pretty simple. It's not a very pleasant choice. So you have to make a decision. So you're... Your one option is your iPhone tumbles out of your pocket or your smartphone tumbles out of your pocket, shatters into a thousand pieces. So viscerally, that doesn't feel good. The other option is I will break a small bone in your finger. <laughs> so the interesting thing about this and why I mention the age range is because there's an age above which this question is read as an insult. Like the idea that this is even a question you would pose <laughs> is insulting to me. And that age is late 20s, early 30s. So at about that point, if you ask people in their late 20s, early 30s, they will say, without hesitation, I'd rather have a broken phone. As you move down from the 20s into the teens, this becomes not so much a question as an opening move in a negotiation. <laughs> so the, the common follow-up question is, once my hand has been broken, that's where it begins, can I still swipe my iPhone? <laughs> Which finger will you break? <laughs> Questions about cost. Will I still have my iPad? Things like that. You know, it's, the, even the fact that it becomes a negotiation is interesting because that's not how it works with older adults who are responding to this. So there's a negotiation. It takes longer to answer. It's a more difficult puzzle. And among teens, people under the age of 19, this is the, the response rate. So more people do say they'd rather have a broken phone, but not by much. So there are a couple of ways of reading the data. As social scientists, we don't just want to look at the data. We also want to understand what it tells us. And I think what this tells us is, is, is a couple of things. One thing you can do if you're an older adult is look at this and say, well, we've broken the generation. This is just a problem with, with younger people today. Another way of reading this is to say, what is it about the phone that changes people's responses when they're younger? And I think what it is is that the phone represents something far more profound and important for well-being for younger people. It's a form of connection that it is not for older people. So older people use phones a little bit differently from younger people. It's a portal to school, to homework. It's the way they, they have genuine friendships that form online and then live online. For older adults, usually what happens is the friendship is formed elsewhere, and then it occasionally transports and happens online. But that, that's not really where it lives. It lives offline. And so there is a completely different form or function that, that, uh, that the, the, the phone takes for people of different ages. So I think that's what's well reflected here, and again, why jobs might have been concerned. And then finally, this is also a reason to be concerned, and I don't think you need to say much more than what's going on here. Just present this. This is a guy flying from LaGuardia, actually, to O'Hare. Um, a friend of mine posted this on Facebook and told me I should check it out. This is a few years ago. Um, you can see it says, is this the future for in-flight entertainment? Guy opposite me on plane this morning with VR gear on and a snazzy bow tie. So apparently this guy sat for the full two hours of the flight from LaGuardia um, like a statue, immobile. At one point, the, the flight attendants had to lift the goggles just to make sure he was alive. <laughs> That's how still he was. Now, if there's ever going to be a good use for virtual reality tech, this is it, right? From the perspective of a flight attendant, if you are a passenger who isn't really there, you are the best kind of passenger. <laughs> if you want to go to the Greek Isles while, while we're, Greek islands while we're flying, that's great. That works perfectly for everyone. So I think this is the best case scenario. But the thing this shows is just how separate this guy is from the rest of the universe. He is living very much inside himself. We talk about kids and, and even adults looking at their phones and how they're removed from the here and now. But that doesn't even come close to comparing to come close to the, the physical barrier you have here. There's no way this guy can interact with anyone else at this moment. Now imagine a room or a restaurant where everyone's behind these, these goggles. The question is, when is that going to happen? Is it going to happen? And it depends who you speak to. Some of the estimates I've heard in interviews are between two and four years from now that a lot of us will experience this, maybe not everywhere, but in some places. So just as the iPhone rose in prominence, in, in commonness, that's going to happen. We're all going to have our own little fold-up virtual reality glasses, and this is what the world is going to look like. And when you look at all sorts of, I mean, these, these industry estimates are usually pretty meaningless, but I think this is pretty striking, the gap between 2019 and 2029 in the size of this industry, the consumer VR and AR industry. So these are the kinds of things that I think Jobs and other tech titans were concerned about in Nick Bilton's article. 
All of this, when you put it together, um, the term that I've used to describe it and a lot of other people use is behavioral addiction. So behavioral addiction is, is a little bit like a substance addiction in a lot of different ways. The big difference is that there is no substance. So a substance, you ingest the substance, it interacts with your physiology in some way, usually with your brain or always with your brain, and you keep using this thing that's ultimately harming you over time. That's true about behavioral addictions as well, except it's not a substance, it's an experience. It's something you keep doing. One of the oldest forms of behavioral addiction is probably gambling. So that's a sort of, that's one that's been around for long enough that um, even the manuals, the diagnostic and statistical manual, the American Psychiatric Association's manual is, is comfortable calling gambling various other forms of, of behavioral addiction an addiction. And we're starting to widen the definition to include gaming and other, and other forms. So the, the definition I like is it's the drive to engage in something that's immediately rewarding, some behavior, that has no, but it, despite the fact that it has negative long-term consequences for physical, mental, social, or financial well-being. So it's, even though it's something you want to keep doing, it's ultimately bad for you in at least one respect. So physical, it could be that you become sedentary, you don't exercise enough. Mental, because it's bad for you psychologically. Um, one thing that the phone seems to do is it's, it's lowered our threshold for boredom, which turns out to be fairly important, especially for kids with self-control issues. If you give a kid, if you visit entertainment on kids, they expect the rest of the world to do that as well. And so doing something that's slow, that requires energy and engagement, like learning to read or to have a conversation, seems much less appealing. Social, I think we all have a pretty good sense of what phones and other screens do to us socially. They obviously remove us, degrade the quality of our relationships. And then financial well-being, a lot of people end up shopping more than they should and spending way more money than they'd like to. Lots of examples of this, gaming, social networks, and so on. You can see them all written up there. And this is an incomplete list. There are lots of different experiences we have online that do this. So what are three of the things, you know, there are more than three, but I'll talk about three of the big drivers of these irresistible screen experiences. Um, the first one is, uh, is one that I, I think is really well captured in this, this question that I asked my MBAs at Stern. Um, this is a problem that Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, faced. They was asked the question, who is your major competition? And if you've taken a marketing class or if you've taught a marketing class or if you've studied marketing, you'll know that one of the really important things to understand is who are you competing against? That's going to drive a lot of your strategy. So Reed Hastings was asked this question a few years ago. And so I asked my class, who, who is Reed Hastings? Who is Netflix competing with? And there are some obvious answers to this. Network TV, uh, cable TV, YouTube, Hulu, and so on. This is not what Hastings said. His response is pretty well known now. I'm sure some of you have heard him say it. When you watch a show from Netflix and you get addicted to it, you stay up late at night. Really, we're competing with sleep. <laughs> so it's not that people are watching Netflix and then they say, actually, now I'm going to switch over to YouTube. It's that they go to bed because it's 4 AM. And it's five episodes deep in the seventh season of some show. So that's what he realized. So he tasked a team to fight sleep. So he said to this team, how are we going to deal with this issue? How are we going to ensure that people watch just one marginal extra episode at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m.? And so this is the, the question he asked. And the answer came in 2012 in the form of post-play. So as soon as one episode ends, the default became the next episode would begin playing. So it's, it's a fairly small shift. Right? Instead of the default being you have to hit the play button, the default became the next episode will automatically begin playing. I'm sure you've all seen this. You can disable it. Most people don't do it. And so as a result, this had a huge effect on the whole industry. It's also something that was taken up at every other platform that had any streaming service. Um, so everywhere where you watch video, you'll have the same thing. This, broadly speaking, is known as the removal of a stopping cue. A stopping cue for humans is a thing that basically nudges you gently along to the next thing in your life. In the 20th century, stopping cues were everywhere in the media we engaged with. So you'd read a newspaper and you'd get to the end of the newspaper you'd have to move on. Or you could just kind of sit still and wait 23 and a half hours till the next one was delivered. <laughs> Most people took the hint and did something different. If you watched a TV show that was on once a week for an hour, that's how they were delivered in the 20th century. <laughs> for those of you who don't know. <laughs> so you would get to the end of the episode, and you wouldn't sit there for six days, 23 hours. You'd get up and do the next thing. 
the same is true for books. There are chapters. There are these kind of natural breaks in, in, in whatever you were consuming. What tech companies have done since, I'd say, in the last 10 years is to systematically eradicate every one of those stopping cues wherever possible. Remove any friction points so that you just don't have those cues to drive you on to the next thing. And it's had a pretty profound effect. Um, one of the ways you decide whether to fund the next season or produce the next season of a show is to look at how many people complete the first season. So you, they watch the pilot, and then how many people actually get to the end of the whole season. Now, if you're getting a high rate, if it's above about 70%, that's a pretty good sign that the show is a success, and you probably want to green light season two. So what this did was, before the introduction of post-play, if you could get people to about episode five or six out of 13 in a season, there was a good chance 70% of those people who got that far would complete the season. After post-play, that became two or three episodes in these very successful shows. So you had to get people to watch much less before they became very deeply engaged in the show. So that's one example. Now, this, this has an interesting history. It begins with casinos, the first place where you could make a lot of money by removing stopping cues. So in a casino, you know, one thing you don't know is what time of day it is. Because one of the stopping cues might be, you know, you, this is the third sunrise I have seen <laughs> since sitting at the slot machine. I should probably check on my kids. That, that would be one stopping cue. So that's one possibility. It's also a maze. It's a physical maze, which is another way of stopping you from leaving. Free drinks. Free drinks is a big one. Yeah, so these kind of loyalty bonuses. There are ways of detecting that a person is about to move on, to leave the machine. And you want to prevent that if you're the casino operator. So one thing you can do is you can look at response times. So if you see that I ryth rhythmically tap the button that makes my video slot machine play, if I start slowing down by even just a few hundred milliseconds, it's a sign that I'm getting fatigued. So that's when the loyalty team comes out and gives me a free drink to short circuit that process so I keep playing. That's how all of this works. It's all very carefully done to remove stopping cues. Now, learning from casinos, you had video games. This, um, some of you will recognize, this is Flappy Bird. How many of you have played this game? OK, so for those of you who haven't played the game, now you have. <laughs> That's, that is a deeply intellectual, enriching experience. <laughs> um, and the way I came across this game, which for a couple of months ruined my life, was I got, I got the link sent to me, the app link. I was sitting on the runway about to take off from Newark to, to LA, so it was a you know, six-hour flight. And Flappy Bird starts, uh, I load it up, I start playing the game. Basically, what it looks like when someone's playing Flappy Bird is this. If I'm holding my phone, I tap the screen, and the bird flies up, and I stop tapping, and he descends. That's it. So if you watch me playing it for three seconds, it looks like this. Imagine watching that for six hours. So I, I had grand designs. I was going to sleep. I was going to catch up on work. There was a lot that was going to happen on this flight. But I played six hours of Flappy Bird. <laughs> and when we landed, the guy sitting to my right turned to me and he said, are you OK? <laughs> and I, I, I didn't I had to introspect and ask, am I OK? I wanted, I wanted to understand more about what had just happened, because I lost six hours of my life, which became a couple of months. And, one of the things that Flappy Bird does in, in deviating from what the games of the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s did is it has eradicated the stopping cue that says, the game is over, you should go and consider doing something else. So in the, you know, the arcade games, the traditional arcade games of the 80s, there's this grand game over screen. You know, the game has, has ended, you have lost a life or whatever. Each time that happens, it slows you down a bit and nudges you along. Flappy Bird, the bird flies into a pole, and he's just reanimated. It almost feels rude not to continue playing. And so six hours later, you've been polite and kept playing thousands of rounds of the game. So removing that stopping cue had a huge effect on its success. And I wanted to know whether other people felt the same way. So I looked at some of the reviews of Flappy Bird uh, on the iOS charts. I should say, <laughs> this, this really spoke to me. <laughs> So deeply, deeply ambivalent. The death of me, but also five stars. Like, it, this is a what, a, what a beautiful, sweet death it is. But it's a death. Um, Flappy Bird will be the death of me. Do not play. You can all read what it says there. It's a little bit 
overblown, maybe, but it does speak to enough people. My favorite part is not so much the review, is that 14 out of 15 people found this helpful. <laughs> it spoke to them. So this is Flappy Bird. At its peak, so it, what's interesting about this game is it languished on the charts for a long time, and then nine months later, for, out of nowhere, it suddenly became successful. It became the most downloaded paid app on the download charts. And um, at its peak, the developer, it was a, a game developer from Vietnam, who was an indie game developer. He didn't make games that generally tended to make a huge amount of money. He was earning half a million dollars a week in ad revenue. But here's the thing that's interesting about him. He felt so bad reading all of this that he went on Twitter and posted a tweet that said, I can't do this anymore. I'm removing the game. And as soon as he did that, he got a flood of emails from people who had not downloaded the game in time, <laughs> begging him for a copy. And so he basically came back and said, I'm going to make sure that my next game is not addictive. And it wasn't, because no one played it. Anyway, <laughs> but, but that's, that's so the, the gaming world learned a little bit from the casino world. And then, of course, this will speak to everyone. The really big queue that drives this, this big removal of stopping queues comes in the form of bottomless feeds. There is no natural endpoint. You can get infinite news, infinite information about your friends. You can read a billion articles, and there will be a billion more. And this is, again, by design. This was not always true. If you're one of the early users of Facebook, you'll remember you had to hit load more to get more content. That stopping queue has been removed. You can see these if you look for them in everything you ever do on a screen, the systematic removal of these queues. And that's a big part of what keeps us there. It's not so much that they've sweetened the deal. It's that once you've arrived, you don't know how to leave. So that's the first big one. The second big cue is the kind of feedback that's built into these experiences, also by design. So if you look at the kind of feedback, you know, very broadly speaking, in the world of behavioral science, there are two kinds of feedback. This is very broadly speaking. Um, this is one kind. This is like, imagine you work a job, and every two weeks or four weeks, you get a paycheck. It's always about the same size and it reflects some agreement you've made, you know what you're getting. This is pretty effective if the reward is large enough. You'll keep doing what you're doing, you were doing before. The alternative is this kind of feedback. Now, this is both in terms of when the feedback is delivered and the size of the feedback, the amplitude. There's a lot of variance. It's unpredictable. This is true for humans, but it's also true for animals, a lot of other animals, that the second kind, it's much more like being in a casino. It's really engaging. So they've built these little boxes with pigeons and monkeys and other animals where they deliver these two kinds of feedback. One of the experiments is called the rat casino. So in the, the rat casino, the rat has to go up whenever it sees a light, and it has to perform an activity like pushing a little bar, and then it gets rat food. Um, little pellets will pop out. The top version, the rat knows that it has to push the bar 10 times, and then it gets a pellet, and it eats the pellet. And when it's no longer hungry because it's had lots of pellets, it stops doing it. It just kind of sits in the cage and hangs out does whatever rats do. I think it like licks its paws for a bit and then just sits. The rats in the rat casino act like crazy people or crazy rats. They, the light pops on. Sometimes they have to hit the bar once and they'll get a reward. Sometimes they have to hit it 100 times and they'll get a reward. Sometimes the reward is one pellet. Sometimes the reward is like a mountain of pellets. It's a jackpot. The, the rats learn this, that there's no real contingency between what they're doing and the outcome. And they think it's the greatest thing ever. They are in a casino. So what you see with these rats is they keep pushing the, button, the bar, and the pellets come out. And then they, they're no longer hungry. They're satiated. They've eaten enough pellets. So instead of doing what the other rats do, which is to just kind of sit there, recuperate, rest, have a nap, whatever rats do, they just keep playing. And they keep playing. And what you see in these rats a few hours later is they're sitting there playing feverishly, just banging the bar. There's a mountain of pellets. And when you look at the reports about these, these rats in these experiments, they end with many of the rats just keeling over from exhaustion. They don't eat, and they stop eating because it's so engaging. Some of them don't eat, and others just die from exhaustion. That is the power of this kind of feedback. Now, humans have other parts of our brains that say, this is fun, but let's maybe have a bite to eat. And so we're better than, we deal with this a little bit better, but it shows you the power of these kinds of reward. And they're, they're built in everywhere. They're built into emails. You never know what you're going to get from email. It's this treasure chest. It could be a terrible email telling you something you don't want to know, or it could be a fantastic email telling you something you can't wait to hear. And so we keep going back to check. It could be just like the rats in the rat casino. This is true every time you post anything on social media. You could get the dreaded no likes. You could be ignored. 
when you wonder whether the, you always blame it on the algorithm when that happens. It's just, yeah, Instagram changed the algorithm. So that's, or you, you might, you know, this might be the one thing that someone regrams, someone famous, and suddenly you've got hundreds of responses. Different people respond to different amounts to this, but for all of us, that's, that's more appealing than being ignored. And then you might also have something like uh, online shopping. You don't know when the, the best deal is going to come up. You've got to, even a site like Amazon, what's going to be on the front page today? And then, of course, not so big in the US, but online gambling is obviously a, a version of this as well, which is, is, not, uh, is not a big deal in the US, but it's a big deal in the rest of the world. So this is built into a lot of these, the screen experiences we have. This, the size of the reward has also changed over time. It's become larger, which again draws us in. In the gaming world, this is known as juice. Juice is the idea that you kind of inject the game with a little bit of extra oomph when you give people rewards. So if you look at the same basic game mechanic, the same underlying game, look how it's shifted over time. This is a basic brick-breaking game. I used to play this in the 80s on my Commodore or my Amiga. I'm sure some of you recognize this. This little ball bounces around and you break bricks with it. That's the most basic version of the game. By the 1990s, it got a little bit more sophisticated. It was a little more juice. It felt slightly more satisfying. The sound was better. You could get the paddle to enlarge and shrink. There would be three balls bouncing around. This is what the game looks like today. There's a professor who shouts things like impressive, epic, insane, things explode, it's like a Michael Bay film in the form of a game. And so this is another, another version of what's shifted over time that's been built in. And when you speak to game developers, NYU has a game center. I spoke to all of them, and they all talk about how one of the first things you teach is how to inject juice. And it's a huge part of what's driving these experiences. The third one I want to talk about is uh, actually two of the authors, Devin Pope and George Wu, are at the booth. Um, this is about goals and the power of goals. And the example I'm going to look at is, uh, is running marathons. This is from a really great study they published that really spoke to me. Um, if you don't know anything about marathons, that's fine. You should know that the world record um, among men is 201, two hours and one minute, and among women it's two hours 14. So that's way over to the left. It's not even on the screen. Um, most people run like around four hours, four to four and a half hours. That's the kind of modal time. Roughly speaking, that's the most common time. So what I, what I want to plot is if, if people were just running as hard as they could, you might expect the distribution. So the height of each bar represents how common that time is. You might expect it to look something like this. So what you see here is that it's not common to be really, really fast. To run in under three hours is really quick. Um, it's common around the four hour mark, and then it tails off. A lot of people start to slow down. Then there are people who walk all the way up to 10 hours and, and above. So you might see this kind of smooth distribution. I've run studies where I've given people a thing called a hand grip dynamometer, which is a device that measures grip strength. If I gave all of you a dynamometer, you would see something like this. It, some of you would be very strong, some less so. Most of you would fall in the middle. So you might expect something like this with marathons. Um, those of you who know this research know that that is, is not what you see. So I've, I've run, I, I run a bit, but I've only run one marathon. Um, and uh, when I ran the marathon, it was the New York City Marathon in 2010, and I, I had the aim of breaking 3.30. That was important to me. Based on my training, I thought it was possible. So I lined up at the start line, and um, there was a guy carrying like a kind of PVC pipe with a big sign on it that said 3.30. So I said to him, what's, what's the deal? What happens if I run with you? He said, you'll run a 3.29. And I said, how can you guarantee that? He said, because I can run a 2.16. So he was, he was fairly confident. <laughs> and so a group of us um, gathered around this guy. I've got to tell you, when you're beginning a race with a guy who can run a 216, it's, it's slightly demoralizing. <laughs> but, and it gets more so as you get tired, because he doesn't. It's like a, like a metronome. Um, and about eight miles in, we all start to flag a little bit. The pace is a little faster than we thought it would be. We forgot that the Verrazano Bridge has a massive incline and so on. So we get eight miles in, about a third the way through the marathon. And um, as we're starting to form a bit of a gap, he, he turns around and he says, come on, you can do it. And then he runs a mile backwards, still holding the sign. So between a guy running faster than you while carrying what amounts to the building blocks of a small house, <laughs> running backwards, he ended up, most of us ended up being left behind. Shortly after, 340 came by. There's a woman holding a 340 sign, and then a guy with a 350 sign went by. 
And I, I was pretty foggy headed at the time, but I realized this wasn't good for my 3.30 <laughs> ambitions. Ultimately, I got to very close to the end of the race. I didn't see the four hour person come by. And a friend of mine was waiting in Central Park about three miles from the end of the race. And he said to me, you're doing so well, the app says you're going to run a 401. And I was furious. <laughs> Felt like a massive failure. So I said to him, um, I'm, I'm going to get under four. And I like bolted off, which given the state I was in was kind of a shuffle. Um, and I crossed the finish line in 357. And the way I did it was I said to myself, if you run above four hours, you have to run another marathon. And as I crossed the line in 357, the per this person puts a, a medal over your head, over your neck. And I, I said, I'm never doing that again. She's like, yeah, everyone says that. But I've stuck to it. It's, it's a decade. <laughs> um, that's, that's not going to change. Um, I like that you, the one thing you clap is my inability to run another marathon. <laughs> um, but one thing to note, I, I did 357. I was like, this is amazing. How many people run just under four? It turns out, in the real data, that's exactly where the biggest peak is. Here I am with everyone else who's desperate, who has a friend saying, you're about to run in just over four hours. I have never in my life been more fatigued than in the last three miles of that race. And that's true for most of these people here. But the thing to notice that's critical is that these dark bars are one minute below these goal times, these round numbers, 259, 329, 359, and 429. What you should notice is how much taller they are than the bars to the right of them. These are people desperately clinging to a sub four. These are people who failed, who didn't achieve that goal. Even in great physiological exhaustion, these goals have a huge hold over us. Now, imagine what they can do when we aren't so physiologically exhausted. A goal might be fun. It might draw us on. And so they are built into everything we do. They're the goals that have, you know, you've got the little chirp on your Fitbit when you do 10,000 steps. You've got video games that have a certain number of levels or other things for you to achieve. Uh, the worst, I think the most insidious one is Snapchat's snap streak. So how Snapchat works is if I send you a snap on Snapchat and you reply in that same day, that is a one-day streak. If we do it the next day, it's a two-day streak, and the streak builds each successive day. The insidious thing about streaks from a psychological perspective is with each successive day, you have way more to lose. And so what you find is that teens have streaks in the order of hundreds of days, and when they travel, They'll share passwords with friends. It'll be this kind of whole thing that is all about keeping the streak alive. It's not at all about well-being. This is not about keeping people connected. It becomes a standalone goal aside from the, the point of the, the whole experience. This one is my personal poison, inbox zero. There are, there are two kinds of people in the world. And you will know who you are when you look at your phone. If you see the little circle with a single digit in it, and you like, like you start twitching, and you're uncomfortable, and you're like, I have to do something about this. I know the speaker's talking about phones, but I really just need to check these emails. Then you are like me. You're an inbox zero person. If your circle is actually an oblong, <laughs> five, six, seven digits, you are the other kind of person, and you will be happier for it. But for many of us, this is a serious goal. There's a whole inbox zero movement. And then, of course, um, Instagram, having likes, follows. This is true for any social media platform, the same thing. Um, we're all sort of ultimately, even though we say we aren't, we're looking for engagement online. There are goals of a certain number of responses or friends or counts of hits or whatever. Now, that may, may not speak to all of you, but it speaks to most people. So goals are everywhere. So you know, taking this all together, what is it that we can do? I, I, so obviously this New Yorker cartoon um, is a very New Yorker cartoon. I also think this may be the single best solution anyone has come up with yet. I, this is not even ironic. This is not meant to be just kind of uh, intellectually funny. I think it's true that physical barriers from your phone are often the best thing you can do. Whether that physical barrier is physical in terms of space or whether it's in terms of time, time spent away from it, that's always going to be the best thing you can do. Um, before we get to that, a few important points. Um, the first one, is this addiction? Is it medical? Does it, that matter? Is that a big concern? A lot of people push back on the term addiction. They say this isn't really addiction. And honestly, I've given you what I think is a definition that fits what we do with our phones. I don't even care if we don't use the term addiction. All you need to talk about is what's actually going on, the phenomenology, what's happening when people interact with their phones. I think that's enough of a cause for concern. Um, I won't do this with, with this audience, but when I've asked people 
in various audiences, like dozens of audiences, to tell me how much of an issue phone use is for them in, in compromising their well-being. From one to 10, where one is I'm totally fine with my phone use, 10 is it's destroying my life. It's common to see a peak around six, seven, eight. So most people say this is something I'd like to fix. Not everyone, but most people. Um, so whether or not that's addiction, it's certainly a thing that I think matters to people. I, is it a medical issue? For the vast majority of people, no. I'm not saying all of us should go and have treatment. Um, I think it's really a structural issue. We should just live our lives a little differently. And obviously, the companies that make these products, with the help of legislation, should do things differently. And we can get more into that if you have questions about it. I don't know if I'll have time uh, in this talk. Um, what is this doing to us? There isn't a ton of causal evidence, partly because this is a fairly new phenomenon. What we really need to do is take babies in hospitals at birth. I'm not saying we will actually do this, but this is kind of the social scientist's um, dystopian dream, where they're randomly assigned. Like baby born, you get a little sticker on your head that says two hours a day. So th <laughs> for the first 20 years of your life, you will be exposed to a screen two hours a day. Next baby in the next room, randomly assigned to 10 hours a day. Some babies, zero hours a day. And then we watch them. What kinds of jobs do they have? What kind of parents do they become? What kind of relationships do they form? Since we can't do that, we have to rely on imperfect data. And that's what we're doing now. And I think there's enough data that suggests we should be cautious about using screens, and especially cautious about how much time kids spend on screens. Um, Top-down solutions are not solutions that um, are coming from us as consumers, but they come from the government or from big organizations or from the tech companies themselves. Uh, not a lot of this is going on in the US. There's a little bit of it happening, a little bit of lip service in this direction from tech companies. Uh, in Western Europe, uh, East Asia, Northern Europe, um, a number of countries are starting to introduce legislation, which is a better sort of top-down overarching macro solution, I think. But that's not happening much here. So what can we do? Uh, again, try the, the simplest thing. It sounds so simple, but it actually it really works. It's very effective. I've done this with a lot of people and watched them go through the process of carving out space and time every day as a habit where you don't have your phone nearby. 75% of American adults say that they can reach their phones without moving their feet 24 hours a day. So your phone's under your pillow, it's on your bedside table, it's in your pocket, it's in a bag next to you, you don't have to move your feet. That is a problem. We say we don't yet have phones implanted in our bodies, but if we can reach them at all times, they may as well be. One small step. So carve out some time, whether it's every day during dinner. Maybe no matter where you are for dinner, whether you're alone with other people, whatever the situation, at home, in a restaurant, make it a phone-free time. Put the phone as far away from you as you can physically put it. That's one option. Um, another good thing to ask is why. Why are you spending so much time on your phone? And this is what a psychologist would do if you were actually going through the process of kind of you know, therapy for your phone use, which some people do. And the first question is why, and you know, there are a lot of different answers. For some people, it's a way of, of medicating against depression or anxiety or loneliness. For most of us, I, I just think it's become the default thing we do in times of very, very mild, modest boredom. You can't get into an elevator for longer than three seconds without every single person pulling out a phone. My timer just beeped at me. All right. So... Um, a couple of other quick things to wrap up. Um, this is an important point. I've come to this over the last few years. Uh, I used to talk about World of Warcraft a lot and the fact that ultimately I thought it was a, you know, a bad force in the world. I think there are some virtues for people who are very introverted. They develop relationships online that I think are worth understanding and worth, I think, celebrating to a large extent because they're very meaningful and they do bring genuine well-being. That doesn't mean you should never have offline relationships, but the relationships People have online, especially if they're a little bit less socially comfortable, a little bit shyer, can be very valuable as well. So that's worth keeping in mind. Phones should never be, or screens should never be in the bed, bedroom. At 90 minutes before bedtime, you shouldn't have a phone with you. The light that they emit, that bluish white light, basically tells your, your brain that it's the daytime. And so you're inducing jet lag every time you use your phone just before bed. Um, I don't think they have any place in classrooms unless you're learning how to code and you need a, 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 some sort of screen. I think they generally diminish your ability to learn in pretty much any context. So I think, and, and actually NYU Stern has, has this policy. So I've never had to teach in a classroom where people have access to screens. I think that's a good thing. Um, and one way of talking to older kids about this that um, a lot of research suggests is pretty helpful 
is to discuss concepts like balance. In, the, in terms of nutrition, we can't always eat dessert. Um, for the environment, you can't always take from the environment. You have to also make sure that it's sustainable. That's how we should think about how we use our, our temporal resources, how much time we have. And this is a kind of helpful way of saying we're not going to spend all our time glued to phones. Just to end, you know, a couple of companies are doing things, some of the big ones are doing some things that suggest that they care about this issue. This is Instagram now having removed likes. So some of you will have been opted into this, um, not by your choice, where it'll, instead of saying how many likes you have, it'll say liked by Greg Maher and others, and you don't know how many likes there are. Uh, Google has a digital well-being suite that's basically about trying to improve well-being online. Uh, Apple obviously has its screen time checks, which are built into their system now. YouTube has not done this, but they have talked about it. Little thing that flashes on the screen and says, you've watched 187 videos. Perhaps you should consider moving on. You can set that limit. Um, and then Instagram has the you're all caught up. You've seen all the new posts from the past 48 hours. The problem with this one is it becomes a goal post. We talked about goals. So you just keep scrolling till you get there. And last, um, in saying thanks, I'll just say the, the, the single best thing I've come across that, that kind of is the best antidote to time in front of screens is something like this. So I made the decision to move with my family out of New York City. We now live in Connecticut. This is half a mile from where we live. And we chose that spot specifically. I spend six days a week here all year round. And it is just incredible how much well-being I derive from this. And I'm not just a single data point. Well, I am a single data point. But the research on what nature, being in the presence of natural environments, moving water, the wind through trees and so on, it's not just poetic. It actually has incredible restorative effects on us. So spending time in natural environments is, I think, the single best thing you can do if you have that option. So one litmus test that I think is useful is to ask yourself, for how much of the day can you tell by what you are seeing what year it is? If you're looking around and you're saying, well, that projector, these screens, these things tell us that it's 2020 or thereabouts, that's one way of living. There should be at least some time in the day where what you're looking at is timeless. It's unbound by time or unattached to time. Whether it's looking at a human being and having a conversation, standing in the forest, looking at like Michigan, whatever it is, whatever you have the option to do, I think the more of your day spent in that state that's untethered to the here and now, the better and happier you'll be. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Adam, for that fascinating talk. So I think we now have a few minutes to open the floor for questions. Um, and Mark is standing with a microphone for anybody who has their hand up. Jasmine, there's one, one here. When you showed the 24-hour day with work and sleep, were you arbitrarily holding constant the work day? Was that reality? Because my sense is that my work day is compromised by my discretionary screen use. So, Dan, my sleep is compromised by yeah. it. So I didn't know if that was theoretical. The, the one other point I want to make is that to the virtual reality, I distinctly remember Fahrenheit 451, he had created an entire immersive room that was surrounded by, and that was that was dystopia in another way. But right. anyway, to the question of the 24-hour day, was that yeah, actual so, or theoretical? So what that is, that's not measuring productivity or actual engagement with work. It's measuring the time between when you leave home and return to home in going to work, sitting down at work. Much of that time is, is spent in front of screens. So that's not even captured by what else you're seeing here. That time between commuting to work, being at work, and commuting home, that hasn't shifted much in the last decade, which is interesting. According to uh, time use statistics, it hasn't shifted much. I was surprised by that. I imagine the quality of work has gone down to some extent because we're more distracted, um, and efficiency may have gone down as well, but time hasn't changed. Yeah. You said you have a two and a three-year-old. Yeah. What is your policy for them? All right, so I have to admit something. Um, so until two weeks ago, my policy was um, they will never go near an iPad. But we just flew to Australia and back. <laughs> and so I surgically attached the iPads to their, not even two hours. It was, it was instant. We, we, we had them because my wife and I have one each. And uh, we were like, this is just an emergency. We won't actually use them. Um, so my policy before that with iPads was they shouldn't be around them. Um, with my son, um, he's the older one. 
when he was two, we, he started asking questions. He started saying the word Elmo over and over again. And apparently his friends had been saying it. And I felt like, you know, there were, there were negative consequences in not at least explaining to him what Elmo was. So we showed him Sesame Street at age two. The problem is he had a six-month-old uh, sister. So she was six months old when she met Elmo and, and has loved him ever since. So uh, it's, it, I wrote this book before I had kids. I was pretty hardline about it. In actually having kids, I've realized this is more difficult. Um, <laughs> turns out everything is more difficult than you would have thought. Um, but So I've had to be a little bit more lax about it. Um, but I have to say, exposing them to these screens, I think, has largely not been great for them. I kind of wished I'd held out a little bit more. Um, and so we're trying to work out ways to dial that back. Now the big experiment is, is trying to get them, trying to wean them off these iPads that they've grown used to over the two weeks of a vacation. I don't know how that's going to go. Yeah. So a uh, question for you about, I'm over here. Yeah, hi. Uh, you know, we're, we're here at U of C, the uh, home of uh, quantitative analysis and uh, law and economics and, you know, marketplace theory. Mm -hmm. So it seems like uh, all of the negative effects you've talked about, can, you can really uh, think of as, uh, as externalities of the apps and the businesses that have been built around our addictions. So, so what's the marketplace solution to either cause the producers to internalize the cost of those externalities or to create an environment where someone can profit from helping us wean ourselves from the addiction? Yeah, so that's exactly what's one of the solutions I've proposed is, is this, you know, if you think about um, externalities in polluting the earth, we now tax companies or we somehow penalize them for that and it, they'll ultimately make the decision to stop at a certain point where it no longer becomes financially viable. There is a version of that that I think might work here as well. People are very squeamish about trading off the well-being of children with, with money, obviously, and so it's a, it's a sort of taboo environment. But something like that might work here. Certainly, if it becomes no longer financially feasible for these companies to do what they're doing, they might have to change some of their tactics. And I think one of the obvious solutions is make the product so good that people pay a subscription rate. So instead of relying so much on, on advertising and eyeballs and how long people spend and eking out a marginal extra minute, you rely on people to just say, this is a great product that I'm willing to pay for. That's tough to do in this marketplace. It's very competitive. People have been you know, habituated into not having to pay, so it's, it's difficult to do. One, one thing that a couple of companies have floated is this idea of having a kind of premium version that, that is friendly to you as a consumer. So Facebook might have a version that's 10 bucks a year. And if enough people opt into that, maybe that version doesn't involve as many ads. The algorithm's a little bit friendlier. I don't know how they would market that. That's their business. But you could do something like that as well. Yeah. So I'm wondering, in a world where um, it seems like there's a lot of game theory going on, you're the person who's not instantly accessible at work. Mm -hmm. You're the person who's not instantly, instantly accessible to your friends. You have a right. fear of missing out or you get punished. What do you do to create healthy boundaries for yourself in that world? Yeah, it's really tricky. It's funny. I, since releasing the book, I've had maybe half a dozen people who have emailed me to say, I am completely divorced from tech. I have no tech in my life. Um, it's very difficult. I, I don't know how they're emailing me. That may be the one exception <laughs> in their life. That's always my first question. Um, but there's a small number of people who actually do decide to kind of roll back to the 1950s, and it becomes the defining feature of their lives. So some people have this very hardline view. Do not have any social media accounts. Do not use email. Don't have a smartphone. I, I have no problem with that. It's just not what I would consider the best solution given network effects, given, as you say, game theory. You don't want to be, you don't want that to be the one defining feature that you are the person who's left out. And so that's why with my son, I ultimately said, you know, he can have access to Elmo. I don't think it's going to corrupt his brain. Um, we'll see. And so it's, it's, it's really difficult. I think di different people set the policy at different points along the spectrum. Um, and for me, it's largely about extracting as many benefits as I can from these forms of tech, not being too hardline about them while recognizing what the costs are and trying to minimize them. And I think when you're thoughtful about it, you recognize there are obviously benefits. My family lives a long way away. My kids don't even distinguish between face-to-face -face interactions with them and using the screen. I think that's kind of a miracle. So when they see them in Australia, we get off the plane, and my, both my kids are like, oh, grandma and grandpa. It's like not a big deal. On the one hand, that was a little sad for my parents. <laughs> On the other hand, it's kind of nice that they felt that connection. So it's just about finding the right, the right boundaries. One more question I think we have time for. Quick 
question back there. What are the negative physical, physiological effects on the brain? Are they long-term or can they be reversed? And could this be attacked, taken, similar to lung cancer with cigarettes that would deter people from chronic use? There's a big group of researchers now who are starting to investigate that question. It's too early to say. Some of them have made soft noises about the possibility that there are certain changes in the brain that seem like they might be hard to reverse. A lot of that is hand-waving right now. We don't really know. Um, but it's something that people are considering carefully at the moment. Um, I don't feel comfortable making a strong pronouncement about it, but it's very interesting and concerning research. And it would really be the holy grail here, right? If you can point to changes in the brain, um, at that point, I think it changes the playing field pretty dramatically and, and changes how we, we approach this issue. So we're not quite there. Um, there are certain other, there are lots of other effects that I think we do know. You know, we, we drive more badly, we're more distracted, um, we spend more time not exercising and moving around. All of that, in aggregate, across the population is obviously very bad for us as a, as a culture and as a society. Thank you very much.